And do you have any questions before I, we start? If no questions, then let's continue. Um, I think we 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 discussed the difference between expressions and statements. Um, and I think I said that languages that have rich expressions and they use more expressions than statements, they are kind of more expressive and um, easier to work with, and they are more concise. Uh, so you can kind of compare some of the properties, especially for things like if statements or if expressions, uh, because you can kind of compose them into a single line much more easily if you have them as expressions rather than statements in the language. And then we we stopped at polymorphism and then we, we will talk a little bit more about polymorphism later. But in general, like from C++, what was polymorphism? What can you say a polymorphic function is or polymorphic behavior is? Yep. Yeah, so that's that's a good um good take on it. Um there is usually the change of behavior based on inputs depends on the input type. So it's not that the behavior changes because I pass 10 instead of 20, but because I passed float instead of integer, right? Um so that's what polymorphism is. Um, so we can kind of adjust the behavior of something based on the type that it deals with. And the way C++ does it is you have concept of virtual functions, and then the function is kind of the same name, the same signature, but based on the kind of a place in the class hierarchy, which is being executed, the behavior may change. So you may have a subclass with the behavior different than the parent class, right? And we use it for doing um, uh, change of the behavior of the of the type or, or the object that we're dealing with. Uh, there is a, a, a very specific uh, pattern in object-oriented programming co called um, object-oriented switch statement. Um, so normal switch, what does a normal switch do? Anyone have you used switch in C or C plus plus? Yeah. It's like uh, uh, casting one of the Exactly. So you basically say uh, switch, and you say if this variable has one of those values, do this, right? So instead of saying if this equals to that, do this. Else, if this equals to that, do that. We have a switch statement, and we say if some uh, like case and then um, case this value do this case this value do this and so on and we have kind of a, a long list of things and then if we have a new case we just inject one extra line of code which says ah for this case do this and then usually at the end you have some sort of like otherwise or some sort of a catch all block which says if none of those cases match then do this right um so we typically do that based on value uh, in C or C++, uh, but sometimes we would like to do that based on the type of the, of the variable. So then it, the, the, there is this kind of a concept of object-oriented switch statement where we basically have like a visitor pattern and we call the same method, let's say apply, and then apply depends on, on what it is applied will do something, something else. Right, so let's say you have a car and a motorcycle and a person, and then you have a, all of them have kind of apply method, and depending on what um, you know what you want to achieve, you will have a different implementation. And then let's say you have a data structure for something for storing your your things, and then you basically say give me an object and you call apply, and depending on what that object type is, you will have a different behavior. Right, so instead of writing like is my object a car? Do this. Is my object, uh, you know, a motorcycle? Do this. Is my object a person? Do this. You have this kind of a uh, much nicer metaphor where you say, I don't care what the object is. I just call apply, and the, I will have the behavior and I expect, right? So sometimes we can convert a traditional like imperative switch statement, especially if we're doing object-oriented programming, to this kind of object-oriented switch statement, and it has. 
um, much nicer properties because when you're introducing something new, you just have to say this new thing has an apply method and all your existing code base doesn't change because you don't need to inject this extra line of code wherever you were doing the case statement, right? It will just work magically by introducing a new type and having which has this apply function, right? Um, all right. So polymorphism is useful because we can kind of uh, differentiate the behavior based on what, what we want to, to achieve. Um, all right, so next, Golang, why we have Golang here? All right, maybe I'm just kind of introducing some of the uh, programming languages you're dealing with this semester. So um, Golang, you already had it with Christopher last week as a contemporary C. It's sort of, a, it's very easy to learn, very simple language. Uh, it's also very easy to use, which means it's sometimes a bit tedious because like you have to do a lot of if statements and you have to do a lot of loops, right? So you will be using if a lot and you'll be using, using for a lot, right? Um, which is fine, like for most things that's okay, but um, at some point, if you have to do a lot of it, you will say, yeah, if there was a better way of doing something, right? So it's very great for networking. It's very great for concurrency. It has this concurrency built in. It plays really nicely with Docker. So you can very easily kind of, a, you know, create your little server for doing something for serving REST API, for example. Um, and it has an amazingly fast compiler. Uh, so with all the languages you've deal so far, if you have a big project, uh, you will be amazed how quick Go compiler is <laughs> uh, and how slow Haskell or Rust compilers are, same with C++, right? Um, but Golang is just great. So especially for large project, multi-people, multi-module projects, it, it just works extremely well. And that was one of the design principles from Google because they wanted something that has a very quick development cycle. You can update something, build it, deploy and test very quickly, right? Uh, you don't want to say compile and then you have to go for coffee, right? Um, yeah, often that's the case. I mean, with some um, larger systems, uh, we have to wait a bit, right? So what do you do when you have to compile something and you have to wait? You're kind of are getting out of the zone, right? You, you were kind of uh, doing something and then for, even if it's like 20 seconds, you're kind of in a limbo with your brain, right? So it's it's kind of annoying. Like if you have to wait and you're programming and you have to wait, it, it kind of is um, super, uh, super annoying. Yeah. There's also uh, for Java, you have to yeah. You have to wait. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So all those really big frameworks, they have this kind of a penalty, right? So they automate certain tasks tasks for you, but at the same time, they introduce a little bit of pain. Um, all right. So with Golang, you kind of get got the idea. I think you um, you know more or less what it is. So comes Rust. So Golang. Uh, we leave it for the cloud, you will learn it there. We may discuss a little bit of Golang here in this course to compare things like how would you do that in Golang or why Golang doesn't have it, right? Um, so what is Rust? Um, Rust is uh, kind of a, like Golang is, let's say, reincarnation of C. So Rust is sort of a, a modern version of C++, right? There are, there are some uh, things in C++ that have been updated over the years. The new specs are kind of introducing a lot of new things, but it has a certain baggage of, um, um, yeah, of historical choices and they are kind of hard to change. So Rust is sort of an attempt to make a system programming language, which is sort of a replacement for C++, but it feels modern. So what does it mean that the language feels modern? How you kind of, um, con you know, compare something that feels old and something feels that modern. It's a very subjective thing, but um, modern programming languages, they have a, a bit of an ecosystem around them, right? So for example, they have usually a package manager and a dependency manager, right? 
so if you are building something and you need a dependency, it's sort of um, easy to find what that dependency could be. And it's easy to say, I want this version of the dependency, please include it in my project. And then if there is a published new version, you, you know that there is a new version, right? With C++, it never really worked. Like the dependencies, you can you have to manage manually. You have to use CMake. It, it, of course, it works, but it's kind of tedious. It feels old, like it's very manual, right? Uh, finding something like, okay, what library do I need for this? It, it's not trivial. Uh, you don't really have this sort of ecosystem. Um, you can find things, but yeah, it's not that that easy. The, the other thing is um, usually with modern uh, tools, you have additional tools. So you have some sort of a code formatter built in, you have a linter built in, you have some support for helping you find bugs or find some things that is a little bit off, right? Um, so Rust and Golang, they both feel modern because they all come with all this kind of uh, tooling built in into the standard language de um, deployment. Um, so Rust is very good because it almost doesn't have a runtime system. So the um, all the core functionality is sort of like C. Uh, you have to say, I need it. And if you don't need it, then the core language is very small. Um, so it's ideal for embedded systems. Um, and you basically ca can have a very, very tiny footprint, right? Uh, Golang is also advertised as uh, um, possible to run on the uh, run um, on the small footprint devices. And there is a project uh, called Tiny Go, which is dedicated specifically for using Golang for programming Arduino and some microcontrollers. Uh, but the footprint will always be a little bit bigger than Rust, right? Uh, Rust has this property that it doesn't have a garbage collector, so the kind of the the executable can be really tiny, like if you don't use a lot of features. So it's very good for embedded systems. Uh, it is expressive. So for example, C++ is trying to introduce like lambdas and some functional uh, flavor to the language, but, and it is there, but it's really kind of um, difficult to use. It, it's, it's not that as nice as it could be. Right, um, and in Rust you have a little bit more uh, expressiveness. So Rust is using more things that are expressions, and you can kind of uh, combine them much more easily. Right, um, it's expressive, but it's not as expressive as Haskell. So out of the different programming languages that you will be exposed to, Haskell is sort of the most expressive and the most concise. All right, and then um, you will. Where would you find like uh, Rust being used? Uh, so Golang, you will find it in some projects like you know Docker is written in Golang. Um, what else is written in? in uh, um, yeah, what's that? Um, there, there is like a um, yeah, I forgot the name of this database, but there is a time series database which kind of mo most systems use for uh, storing logs. That one is written in Golang as well. Um, there are different kind of largish tools which are written in Golang for networking purposes because it comes with quite a good support for networking. So where would you see Rust? Um, you would see Rust in um, kind of a system uh, level. So recently there has been an introduction of Rust code bases to go into uh, Linux kernel. So you can kind of have, you, you could see Rust in, in uh, Linux kernel, for example. Uh, Mozilla, which is the the you know the the parent of Rust, they've designed Rust specifically to migrate the the code base for Firefox from C plus plus to Rust. Um, they had a lot of bugs related to uh, synchronization and multi-threading, um, so they wanted something safer. Uh, and then by moving some of the core functionality, which was responsible for multi-threading, to Rust, they kind of solved most of their problems. Right. Um, does it mean that uh, Rust is better than C++? Not necessarily, right? You can kind of achieve same similar things in C++, but it may be a little bit more tedious or a little bit more um, labor intensive, right? Um, so Rust is really good for cross-platform programming, for system level programming, for some embedded programming, uh, and it is kind of getting uh, into the um, the way of um, mobile and web programming because of WebAssembly. 
We will talk a little bit about WebAssembly later, but um, Rust is often picked as a sort of a source language to do something with WebAssembly uh, because of this very tiny uh, dependencies on the additional things and of the core runtime system being so tiny, right? All right, so this covers Rust and then Haskell. Um, so where Has Haskell comes from? Um, Haskell is a language which is often focusing on fundamentals and experimenting with what programming languages could be. So a lot of programming languages, including, uh, including Rust, are borrowing features from Haskell, right? So they all see some of the Haskell features as good things and they try to have them, right? Um, so if you know Haskell, it's sort of like knowing a meta language, which is very useful to know because then you can easily jump into concepts which are in other programming languages and they are not new. So most programming languages, they say, oh, look, we have this new feature. You can do async or you can do uh, something, right? We can do lazy collections. It's like, okay, like we know that for 30 years already, right? It has been in, in Rust for 30 years. Um, so a Lambda functions, things like that. Um, they are all known. It's, it's like, it's new in C++, but it's not really new. It's like just being introduced, right? So if you know Haskell, it's sort of like being able to predict what the frameworks will be in 10 years time, because everything is in, which is in Haskell will probably be somewhere in your frameworks or in languages that you will learn, right? Um, so it's kind of a, a good language to know what is gonna happen in the future. Is that language very useful for your day-to-day -day programming? It depends what sort of programming you do. So we will discuss where this language fits uh, and where you might actually use it in real life. Um, so it is a kind of a godfather of um, many programming languages. It's a precursor. Um, and it's kind of nice for us because it will challenge the way we think about programming um, because it will kind of introduce concepts that we are not familiar with. So it will sort of uh, make you a better programmer because you will see problems in slightly different way to what, how you see problems today. Um, it will make you a better programmer and it's like the most expressive language I know. Uh, so there are probably languages which are even more expressive. Uh, we talked about it last week a little bit about, for example, constraint, um, constraint based programming where you can express certain dependencies of your domains. Um, but this one is like uh, one of the, the most expressive languages I've been exposed to and it will um, it will kind of demonstrate how expressive languages feel. Uh, some people like it and some people are kind of get really into it and they are really looking for this beautiful concise notations of solving certain things. Mm -hmm. And for some people it's too much. The, the, the kind of a conciseness of the language is like too much to process. So they kind of fall back to kind of more imperative, more step-by-step -step expressive um, of what they want to achieve. It, I don't know, like it probably depends on your sort of style of thinking, um, but no matter what, I think it's a kind of possible to train yourself to think one way or the other. So even if you find it kind of hard and even if you find it kind of too much to, to, to have this kind of a condensed expressiveness, uh, you can train yourself to kind of enjoy it and to kind of use it for your benefit. So I think it's just a matter of training. And there has been some research demonstrating that the programming language that you are exposed to first biases you to the certain way of thinking. I, I think I talked about it last week as well. So, you know, you basically all have a certain bias because of the first programming language you've learned. And now we will try to kind of uh, make this bias a little bit less. Um, yes, it's very good. Haskell is very good for a very complex systems and very large systems um, because of the, of the very rich Haskell type system. Uh, so that's why it's, it's quite good because it's easy to maintain um, your software, right? So most of the time, if you have to introduce a change into, imagine that you have a really complex system, right? Let, let's say it's a, uh, it's a Firefox engine, right? So it has a lot of modules, it's very complex, and then you're introducing a change. Um, then when you compile it and it runs, how do you know that you didn't break anything? 
Well, you have to have a test harness. You have to actually test all the functionality and you sort of run your project against this testing harness, right? Um, in Haskell, a lot of tests are, or checks are done by the compiler. So when the project compiles, you almost always have a non-breaking change. Um, so all your tests will actually pass. Uh, but in languages like C++, that's not necessarily the case because you have a lot of memory kind of and side effect dependencies, right? Um, so you have to test for all the edge cases and everything. Whereas here, it, it will kind of be almost always correct. You will fight to make the compiler compile your, your project with changes and you will kind of uh, pull your hair out and say, yeah, why it doesn't compile? Why it complain about this and so on. But once it compiles, I almost always have the case that it actually works correctly, right? Um, and that's kind of a good feeling. It, it gives you a little bit more um, um, sort of uh, trust in what, like, what you've introduced. Okay, so what is Haskell? Haskell is functional. Um, so the, the concept, the, the core concept in the language are functions. Okay, we know functions. We, we've seen it in C and C++ as well. It's pure and lazy, okay, those are new concepts, okay? Uh, what does it mean that the function is pure? We talked about it last week. It means the function takes arguments and then computes something and it doesn't depend on the context and it doesn't depend on the, uh, and doesn't make any side effects, right? So it's like the, the pure function will always return the same thing, given the same arguments, right? So it has kind of nice properties. So, um, I don't have a pen, I don't think. Oh, well, maybe I do. All right, so let's see if this one writes. So if I have a function f, it, it writes. And I give some, some arguments, right? So I put some arguments here. So let's say I called f with one and two, okay? And then I compute the result. Let's say the result is five, okay? If I see f one and two anywhere else in the code, I actually don't need to run that function again because I already know what the result is and it will always be five, right? So I have a property where if I see it ever, uh, everywhere else in my code, I know I can replace it with five and it will be true, right? So that's kind of amazing because it means I only have to run this function once ever in my life and then never run it again, right? Um, so that's one property. The other property is that um, if I have two functions in, in, in my code, if I have, let's say, f, uh, again, with one and two, and then I have g, again, with one and two, and in c, I have to do this one first, and then I have to do this one second, because I don't know what this function does to the environment, to everything, right? My g might be reading some global variable and might depend on f who might be modifying a global variable, right? So I have to do this one first, this one second, right? In a pure functions, uh, I know this one will always return the same thing, no matter where it is. And this one will always return the same thing for those arguments, no matter where it is. So I can reorder them. It doesn't matter in which order I will kind of run them because they will always be the same result, right? Um, also, I can run them in parallel because I kind of don't, I don't have this kind of linear dependency on my pure functions. So I can easily parallelize my code because the compiler knows, you know, G and F will always return whatever they return. It will be some result one, and this one will have result two. And it doesn't matter in which order I, I kind of execute them, right? So uh, pure has, um, pure functions have a lot of benefits for reasoning about what the code is doing and reorganizing it such that it's more eff effective and efficient. For example, parallelizing it and to take an advantage of multi-core architecture, right? Um, so if I have eight cores and I have F and G in C, I have to say F, do F and then do G in a single, single core, single thread. If I know as a programmer that those can be done independently, I have to manage it myself. I have to start two separate threads and say, oh, in this thread do F, in this thread do G, and so on, right? I have to take care of it. Uh, but in, in pure, um, uh, in language which supports pure functions, and if I know those functions are pure, 
the, the compiler or the runtime system can do the work for me, right? So what is lazy? So what, what is lazy and what why it's useful? Yep. For example, exactly. So we don't evaluate everything when the expression is in the code. So for example, if I say A equals, I don't know, um, uh, so some complex, complex function which cal calculates A, right? Uh, and then I am kind of uh, doing something, doing something, and I have an if statement. And then based on the choice of the pro of the user, I either use A for something or else I don't use A, I do something else. So if I never use A, why I would spend time calculating it, right? The runtime system will, will say, okay, A is this kind of result of this complex function, but I will not do it here. I will wait until I really need A. And then at some occasions it may turn out I never really need a day, so then I never need to do this, right? Um, so for example, this is already kind of optimizing my code, right? Of course, if I'm a programmer, I may in C, I, which doesn't have this lazy property, I may think about it and I may say, yeah, you know, look, uh, in this branch, we never use A, in this branch, we use A, so maybe we don't do it here, maybe we just do it in this branch, right? So again, I will kind of do the optimization myself, right? But then you have to think and you have to reason about your program yourself. If you have lazy functions and you kind of know that they, everything is kind of lazy, the, the language kind of helps you with everything, right? So you don't have to do it yourself again. Um, all right, and then you have kind of infinite collections and you can also deal with kind of streams, right? Because um, if I have... Uh, certain processing to do and i'm only doing it for what i need i can kind of deal with much more than my ram can handle right because i can kind of continuously doing something right um so it's also quite good for for streams it has a very concise notation so some people say uh oh haskell is so ugly like i hate haskell syntax and i love rust right i'm the opposite like to me, Rust has the ugliest syntax ever and Haskell has the most beautiful one, right? It's kind of very concise and very easy. It's kind of very easy to read and you have not much noise. You, you, what, what I mean by noise, you, you don't use characters just for the uh, compiler and the um, you know, uh, tokenizer to know what you mean. It's kind of a very simple to read. It's, it's almost like uh, reading mathematical notations. Uh, whereas uh, Rust, has a lot of things and a lot of uh, noise. Like when you have a, a line of Rust code, it has all those brackets and all those ticks and everything is like, oh Jesus, like it's kind of really difficult to follow, right? Uh, Haskell doesn't have that. It, it has a very simple and kind of concise notation. It is a little bit academic. So uh, you may not really use Haskell later in your life. It may not happen, right? You may not need it, um, but that's fine. You will definitely use it for solving some uh, programming puzzles and you will kind of enjoy using it later uh, once you learn it. And as I said, once you learn it, you will know certain concepts which will be introduced in programming languages like in five years time uh, because you will be already exposed to them here. All right, um, yeah, I have to tell you that Haskell is difficult, right? Uh, to learn Haskell, you probably need like maybe five, six years to be kind of really fluent in it. Uh, so it's not the language that you can just pick up on the weekend and be kind of really good at it. It's something like, you know, playing chess or playing Go games. Um, it's a little bit like it takes some time to organize your thinking to be kind of efficient and effective in it, right? Um, so you basically need to start with some small projects and then your understanding and your kind of uh, mastery will grow. But it is a difficult language. It's probably the most difficult language there is uh, to learn. All right. Um, so please join. We will have some some um, quizzes.
where you can score points and win with your colleagues. So, um, yeah, so pure and lazy are kind of uh, the keyword here. Uh, we will be doing quite a lot of pure functions and we'll be doing a lot of lazy computations. Um, when I started learning functional programming, my, my supervisor like introduced me to it and says, yeah, it's so fun because this language doesn't have any variables. And I was like, what? How can you program anything without variables? So no, no, it's fun. You will see. And it's like, yeah. So for the first like maybe a year, I hated it. Like I always wanted to like say, yeah, I want this variable, and then I want to do something with it. But as you become kind of better and better in in functional programming and in Haskell, you actually realize you you hate variables because they kind of introduce you additional things you have to take care of, and it's so much nicer if you just can express things in like pure functions where you have this um kind of uh, properties that the language takes care for you, right? Uh, so don't be discouraged. Like um, I also didn't like Haskell initially. Um, so you may not like it initially, but it may kind of grow on you later. All right, so let's try some quizzes. So Haskell, Rust and Go are all interpreted. Some are compiled and some are interpreted. They are all compiled. All right. So which languages do, did you think are interpreted? Who, who said that some are compiled and some are interpreted? Which languages did you think are interpreted? Pascal, yeah? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so Rust is compiled, same as C++. Uh, Haskell is compiled, and Golang is compiled. And they are all compiled to the machine code. There is no intermediate bytecode or anything. They are actually compiled to a native platform, right? So if you want x86, you will get x86 binary. If you're running Mac and you need ARM, you will get ARM, right? So it's like there is no intermediary um, layer there. All right, so we have some people who are doing well and some who are doing a bit less well. All right, so another one. Again, three languages. And again, uh, asking about type system. All are dynamic, all are strictly typed, some are strictly typed and some are dynamic. So what is the type system? Yeah, nice, again, some people uh, thought some languages are strictly typed and some are dynamic. So Golang, who thought Golang is dynamic? All right. <laughs> uh, Haskell, who thought Haskell is dynamic? No one? Rust. All right, so all are strictly typed. The type of a variable cannot be changed during the life of the variable. So if you declared something to be an int, or int you know, 32, or i 32, depending which language we're talking about, forever this variable will have this type. Right. In dynamic, we can declare p to be a string. And then later in the program, you can say, yeah, by the way, p is now one. Right. And that's dynamic. Uh, you cannot do that in none of those languages. Like once something is of a certain type, let's say this one is of type string, p, then p will be forever type string. Right. Yeah. 
does this have anything to do with casting or is casting a different kind of sugar? Casting is a different thing. Yeah. So something, for example, we can have, um, let's say we are talking about, um, let's say we have uh, a student, right? So P is a student uh, and student is a type. So we have a class called, called student and it inherits from, let's say it inherits from a person and then person inherits from an object, right? So what is the type of P? Well, the type of P is a student, but it is also person, but it is also object, right? Because student is a person and person is an object. So the type of P is student, but it is also a person and an object. And then we can cast. So we can say, I want you to treat P as a person, or I want to treat P as an object, or I want to tr treat P as a student, but P is all of those things and it's like fixed. It cannot change, right? If I, if I have another uh, hierarchy, so I have an object and then I have an animal, uh, capital A, animal, and then I have a dog, right? So I have another kind of a relationship. So dog is an animal, which is an object. P cannot suddenly from a student become a dog, right? Uh, because it, it, it's sort of, it, it's a different type. But uh, P in like C++ is student, person, and object at the same time, right? So casting is just kind of a, a kind of like a view over a particular type hierarchy such that we see it as a particular thing, right? It's very kind of uh, important when we do numbers because in Haskell, we have kind of a number uh, type class. So we say uh, all numbers are num, right? But then I have things like uh, integers or float, uh, or I have like integer. Uh, so then if I have P, which is like an int, uh, they are all type, they are all kind of uh, inheriting from num. And then uh, depending like what I do, I either have type casting or I have type coercion. So I'm kind of converting like one type to another, right? So if I have a float, uh, I can say, I don't want to treat it as a float. I want to kind of coerce it, kind of uh, convert it to an int, right? Uh, and that's like uh, P type is fixed, but you can kind of uh, morph it to something that uh, is allowed in the language, right? Um, but in dynamic languages, I can kind of assign it outside of this hierarchy. I can kind of make P to be a string, which is completely outside of this kind of a number hierarchy, right? All right, so another one. Yeah, this one is a bit harder. So the, the other two are easy. So all compiled to a binary, no problem. Uh, all have strictly typed, uh, all are strictly typed. And it's kind of easy to find uh, which language is which. Uh, give me an example of um, dynamic language. Uh -huh. JavaScript. JavaScript. Uh, another example, Python, another example, Perl, PHP, uh, there is a lot, Bash, right? There is a lot of uh, languages which are kind of dynamic. Um, give me a language which is interpreted. Python. Yeah, so Python used to be kind of interpreted, but it has this kind of a just-in-time compiler now. So some people say, no, no, Python is compiled. It's like, yeah, kind of not really, like I don't get the executable, right? So if I have a Python source code and I don't get the binary for my ARM, I wouldn't call that language compiled, right? Um, so it is kind of, but it's not it's not interpreted neither, right? Um, you, you understand the difference between something being interpreted and something being kind of just in time compiled? So let's let's kind of have a quick uh, refresher. So if I have my uh, CPU, so I have a certain architecture here. I have a certain CPU architecture, right? Um, and then I have my source code. Um, so if I generate a binary uh, binary file which executes on this architecture, we have a compiled um, compiled language, right? So C, C++, you get your source code, you get some 
object files, they are linked, compiled, and you get an executable. And if you get an executable on for Windows on x86, you cannot run it anywhere else, right? So that's kind of uh, uh, tied directly to the architecture, right? So then we have two other two other cases. One case is uh, we take our source code and we um, have some sort of uh, intermediate language, and we usually call it like some VM, some sort of uh, virtual machine, right? Um, so an example of, of virtual machine is JVM for Java, uh, .NET for .NET, uh, and then Python uh, for Python, right? So I have some sort of a VM which this source code is compiled into, and it, it is represented as a bytecode. So I have some bytecode, which is not machine code, like this one is machine code, so machine code, but this one is some sort of bytecode, which is platform independent. Machine code is tied to my, you know, particular CPU, like x86 or ARM, uh, but bytecode is kind of universal. It's always the same, right? So if I compile my Python into the bytecode, and then I have my runtime system, uh, runtime system which takes this bytecode and just in time compiles it into the machine code, um, we call it kind of a, a VM or virtual machine or just in time compilation or whatever it is, right? So eventually on my CPU, I run the logic of this of the source code uh, via this bytecode compiled to the machine code, right? Uh, so I have this kind of uh, intermediate representation, which is then uh, executed via the machine code directly on my on my CPU, right? But if I take the source code and I either use it as it is, so for example, you take bash script, right? And then you try to run it, right? So what will happen? There will be an interpreter, uh, interpreter, which reads the source code, reads what to do, and does it, right? So then this interpreter is compiled on x86 or on ARM or something, and this interpreter talks directly to my CPU, right? And then if my software says a equals one, this interpreter says, okay, I need a variable A and I need a value one, and I kind of tell the CPU to do it, but it doesn't compile this into any machine instruction, right? It sort of interprets what the software is doing kind of line by line and kind of executes it, but there is no kind of interpretation, uh, there is no compilation step to actually convert this into instructions directly into the CPU, right? Um, so interpreters, because they don't have this compilation step, are usually a choice for things that are required um, very quick execution, right? So you want something to be kind of like a user is doing something and you want this to be kind of uh, done, right? You don't want to compile it, load it, and then do it. You're kind of interpreting what the, let's say, user is ex uh, entering, and then you kind of are doing it. So all the shells like bash, um, or Perl. Um, I'm not sure about Perl. Perl might kind of migrate to this. And originally Python as well, uh, were like this, Python. Because you wrote your Python script, then you had the Python interpreter for x86 Windows or for ARM, and then you feed it with the source code and it would be kind of do, like simulate uh, like a CPU for you and kind of do what you want, right? Uh, but, so, the good thing about this one is that it's kind of a pass to start, but if you have complex logic, if you have like loops or something, it's actually slow to, to run, right? Because it has to be doing it for you, kind of here, not here. Um, so a, a lot of languages, including Python, they said, yeah, uh, like Python is too slow. We It cannot be used for anything serious. It can be only used for some small things. So we need to kind of uh, compile it and we need to have this bytecode representation. So they migrated to this model, right? Um, so now Python is kind of in this category, right? Um, so it, it is kind of interesting because uh, C-sharp is also in this category, right? 
And you would say, no, C sharp is really different to Python, but it's kind of not really that different anymore, right? It's it's kind of in the same kind of box. So C sharp, Java, Python, all those which have this kind of a bytecode representation, which is kind of just in time compiled, uh, are here. Uh, and the interpreters are only for like Lua. Lua is interpreted, right? Um, Bash, all those. Yeah. So Lua is another a good example uh, where you just embed your Lua interpreter like into your game or into your software, and then you can run scripts. The user changes something and you kind of run it immediately, right? Um, what what also, so uh, just, just in time kind of abbreviated to JIT is like when you take a piece of bytecode and then you compile it to a machine code and then you run it when you need it. So if the function is called, you say, oh, do I have it compiled? No, I don't. I will take the source code for that function or the bytecode for that function. And I will kind of compile it into machine code and I will kind of cache it. And then I will, every time the function is called, I will use the compiled version, right? Um, there is one more term. It's called ahead. So it's called um, AOT, ahead of time. Because you can take all this bytecode and say, I want to compile everything into machine code and then run it, right? So when Android started, they were doing mostly interpretation, <laughs> right? So your um, your code was sort of uh, interpreted. Uh, then they migrated to just in time compilation. So they could, like, you start your Android app, it reads your bytecode from Java because uh, Android was using Java, uh, JVM kind of opcodes, and it was kind of uh, um, just in time compiling it. But modern uh, Android phones, when you start an app, they will actually ahead of time compile everything and then launch your app such that there is no kind of a um, wait time while your app is running, right? So you, you have those two different things depending when you are compiling the bytecode. Uh, either you're compiling it when you need it, so then you will have a stutter sometimes because you, you're kind of calling a function which hasn't been compiled yet, and then you need to wait for the compiler to finish, or you're kind of compiling everything ahead of time, and then you're running your program, and then there, there will be no stutter because you have everything pre-compiled, right? So for example, if you have a game, and suddenly you, you, you're calling a function which hasn't been compiled, you would have kind of a, a bit of a you know latency problem, right? All right, so let's do this one and then we'll have a break. So this one is not that obvious. All languages have type inference. None of them have, have type inference and some of them have type inference. <laughs> all right, so all languages are compiled, all are strictly typed, and all have type inference. Uh, what does it mean that the language has a type inference? Yeah. It can uh, just see what type you write in the variable. Exactly. So all languages which allow you to say, um, like if you have a variable P, and you say it's uh, it's one or it's a string without you telling it that it is a string, but the compiler will infer that it is a string uh, from what you're doing. Those are with type inference, right? So in Golang, you have it because you have, um, you can do this. You can say P, you know, equals like with this dots something, right? And then you're not telling compiler what P is. It will infer what type it is based on what you're doing on the right-hand side, right? They also have this var, right? So languages which has var usually have type inference uh, because they have to work out what, what the P is. Uh, so Rust and, um, and Golang are kind of here. In C++, you have auto, right? So you say auto P. You didn't say to the compiler what type of P is, but the compiler will infer it, right? So Rust, Pascal, Golang, they all are, they have type inference built in. Uh, all right, so then just tell me why this semester we're learning 
all compiled strictly typed with type inference languages. Yeah, more robust code, large projects. Good answers. Performance. Yes, good developer experience, good uh, team experience, and good performance, scalability. Exactly. So we can sum it up. All good, very good answers. Because uh, it's a programming course. We're not learning scripting. We're learning programming, right? All right, so let's have a break. Um, uh, how long should we have? 10 minutes? Yeah, let's do 10 minutes. Hey, yep. Um, I think I might have requested access a little bit too late. Okay. So have a good space. Yeah, so I will do it now. Yeah, by the way, um, everyone requested access to the course repo, to, to the co course uh, repository on Git. If you did, then I will uh, generate your workspace if it hasn't been generated yet. Ay, 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 ay. Wrong code. Will there still be like extra credit for getting that early? Or some, wasn't there something like that last year? Yeah. So so we, we will we have it. So if you do the lab uh before Friday, mm -hmm. then you get extra bonus for that. Yeah. Do I just upload them in the workspace? Because I think didn't we like merge something? Yeah, so I will I will explain it. Yeah. Uh, let me just finish this. Okay. Then yeah so it's doing it and you will get your workspace in a in a second um so with the labs what happens is we have this human in the loop process now so you basically have to um talk with one of the tas and say i've done the labs and you have to show them so you have to kind of uh have a, a short like show and tell like oh yeah i've done this and they will kind of tick you off and they will give you the points in the system so we have like internal system for the teaching assistants uh where they give kind of a points and you for each lab there is like five points plus this one point for being on time and then if you're not on time then you don't get the bonus but you can always do that later right yeah and then they will kind of do it for you so you don't um you have your workspace and you keep all your stuff in the workspace but it's not automatically checked until you reach out to the ta okay yeah exactly exactly yes exactly and then for like it, because sometimes you may want to do it online. Mm. So you can say, yeah, my, you know, uh, Arnut, my code is here and they have access to your workspace. So they can check it uh, when when you talk to them. Yeah. yeah. Will the 
like this session on Friday, will this be because it's listed as a lab? Yes. Lab so so the session between two and six, yeah, two and four is the the lab session. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Exactly. And that's the dedicated time for you showing the tutors what you've done, and they will be always here. So it's like the best time to show them. Yeah. 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 Thank you. You're welcome. Exactly, exactly. Yep. Uh, yeah. This is the command to install Haskell, right? But if I just press enter, it just says it can't find the place to download it. But it's here. Yeah, you have lots of space. Yeah. So that's strange. Yeah. Uh, yeah, check with Arnold. Uh, because he is also on Windows, so he can kind of check it. Because I'm not using Windows, so it might be a bit Windows specific. Wait, who was it? Yeah, he, the, the guy in the glasses there. Okay. Yeah. Hey. Hey. I'm not sure why, but I can't run a task on the intelligence. It's like I'm getting like like. Yeah, so how did you create it? How did you start the project from last year? Last year, it's not, it's not working now. Okay, so I have like intelligent installed and uh, and you have Haskell installed, yeah. Haskell stuff, but so like I said, work last year. Yeah, not so what, what happens when you click setup SDK? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure where it's located. So you you kind of need to find it. So you yeah. need to find where your kind of a stack is installed. Yeah, and then you need to point it where the stack is, and it will kind of wire itself up. Yeah, yeah. and also there's one more word. If you create like a new project, because I want to work on lab one and two. Yeah, so like if you go. Uh... Yeah, so this this doesn't work that much. So it's better if you don't do it this way. It's better if you say stack new in the command line. Yeah. It generates the project for you, and then you import it in IntelliJ. Or is it like, um, yeah. do I use like the power sheet or the? Yeah, so, the... yeah, here. Yeah, okay. here if you say stack new, and then you say um, new, and then you say some name. name. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but no, don't, don't use dash. Yeah, yeah exactly. Then it will create kind of a lab 11 folder for you. Uh, you see, it created a lab 11 folder and then it kind of does everything like which needs to do to, to be done. And then in IntelliJ, you say, import me that project now. Where can I find it? Yeah, it's already here. So if you say dear, yeah, yeah, say dear, enter. You will have a folder called lab 11 and that's the folder where your project is. So if you go to IntelliJ and say new, new, and project from existing sources, then you can kind of um, go to your, go go up to your, to user, yeah, here to Majid. Majid, yeah, and then you should have a lab 11. Yeah, this one. So yeah. click on it and say, okay and say Haskell stack next. And here you have to pick this. It, you, need, you need to find where, where the stack executable is. Yeah, exactly. And then it will work, yeah. Because I tried this one. Ask us or not. Do you know where the stack executable is on Windows system? Uh, yeah, I can, I can look it up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. 
Yep. I'm having some uh, issues with some my uh, laptop. Okay. <laughs> uh, so I'm running a two Linux. Yeah. Uh, and I have about 128 uh, gigabytes. Yeah. Uh, this uh, I think about 50 is reserved for the operating system. Yeah. Uh, and I was downloading, I was doing some now, uh, I'm taking malware on the other side of the hand, I'm downloading a couple of VMs. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I would constantly have to like delete stuff from my computer. And stuff. Yeah. So, I'm not sure if there's a smart way I can solve it. What laptop do you have? Uh, Does it have a USB 3? Uh, the from 2017. Okay. I'm not sure if it has the... But it has the kind of the modern USB? No, it doesn't. Yeah, because if, like with this USB, if you have an external drive, which is fast, yeah. it's almost the same as your hard drive. So you can actually keep your uh, IntelliJ and your code and everything on an external drive yeah. and just plug it in and use it. Like I had a Mac, Mac mini, not not mini, the Air uh, before with 128 and I had the same problem. And I basically had like a memory stick, um, which I use the, which I use for the development. Um, so you could do that, you could try that. Just get yourself like a fast uh, SSD type uh, memory stick. Yeah. Uh, and kind of uh, keep stuff there uh, so you can buy like 128 gig kind of uh, but don't buy like an external drive buy like a memory stick okay. yeah to, to, to have like a you, you know what I mean like to have like a SSD um, storage not not the plate storage yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. I have, I have the that part. Yeah, so hard disks are fine for backups, but they are kind of sluggish. Like if you want to compile things, so yeah, they are slow. But the SSD will be like, you will see no difference. Uh, although with USB 2, yeah, USB 2 not, is not as fast as the USB 3, so you may feel a little bit sluggish. Um, yeah. I mean, as long as it can pass correctly on the panel. Exactly, yes, exactly. So 128 is, is a bit of a small st storage space, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I was wondering if I could do that symbolic for Ah, uh, for Rust you can probably do it. Um, for Haskell it's a little bit more complicated. Uh, but for Rust probably yes. Uh, there they have a Rust playground and it has a built-in kind of compiler and you you have a code, uh, highlighting and so on and. Yeah, you may, and, and we got doing small things, so you may give it a try, yeah. But what I would do, I would try to get myself like a memory stick, 120 gig or, you know, 64 gig, and then you just see how fast it, it feels. Um, for me, it felt fine. Um, and on that on that Mac Air, I, I don't think I had the USB uh, 3. I had the USB 2, uh, like a normal memory stick, yeah. All right. Um, All right. So let's continue. Uh, I th there was a couple of questions. So one question is, um, okay, uh, you do need to configure um, 
your IntelliJ or your IDE and um, you know, I'm not using Windows and some of the some of the questions you have are kind of Windows specific and I don't know. Uh, I, I, if you have a Mac, I can help you, but if you have Windows, you need to talk with TAs. Um, so Windows kind of uh, is not my strong thing, but, you know, talk, talk to teaching assistants. Um, in IntelliJ, uh, creating a new project uh, inside IntelliJ didn't work last year, didn't work two years ago, and I predict it's not going to work this year neither. So don't do it. Don't say, oh, I have a new project in Haskell or in Rust and then blah, 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 right? Use stack. So go to command line, say stack, new, and then, you know, lab two, uh, create your project using stack and create your project using cargo. Uh, so once you do this, say cargo new lab two, right? Once you do this, this, this commands will create a folder for you with the pre-initiate project. And then you go to your IntelliJ or to your IDE and say import from sources. And they will recognize this. This is a stack project and this is a cargo project and they will wire itself up properly. So when, when you're doing new, uh, don't do new in the IDE, do new in the command line and then in the IDE say new and then import import from sources, right? Because that's like uh, how it works. It should work with the new, but it sort of didn't work the last couple of years. So it probably is not gonna work again. Um, what else? Uh, there is a workspace for you. Uh, so there is a, a, a GitLab project for course. That's where we share the lecture materials and announcements. And there is a workspace uh, space for you where we where you work you are the owner of that workspace you can create as many projects as, as you want uh, and you can kind of do uh, keep using it for your portfolio for your for your things right um it's same as we we did last year but last year we had um course we have assignments and then we have the workspace this year the assignments we don't have everything is in the course uh repo and then um you have your own workspace for doing your work. And last year also, when you submitted a Git request uh, into your into our assignments, I was actually checking it. Uh, this year, if you have something in your workspace, nobody's gonna check it until you request it. So you have to ask a TA, oh, uh, look, Arnold, I'm, I'm done with the lab. Can you check it? And then Arnold will say, yeah, yeah, I will check it. And then we'll have a short chat in the lab. So that's what we have the lab sessions for. The lab sessions are for just talking with me or TAs and like uh, checking things in, in the labs. And then we have like a spreadsheet with all the points for you. So then we give you points if you get ticked, right? But nothing's gonna happen if you don't approach one of us. We don't browse your workspaces, right? So you actually have to kind of uh, request like a check. Um, why are we doing the the, the discussions? Uh, because it's kind of much more um, informative of what you know and what you don't know and how you've done your tasks and like what you, we can help you with, right? Um, so we, we kind of trying to keep it a little bit um, like human, right? Programming is a team sport. We can learn from each other and like chatting is a good thing. So I kind of encourage that. Okay, so um, uh, where I was, uh, yeah, so labs. Any questions about the labs? Yes. So the points used for uh, getting the obliques done. So the oblique is to get 40 points um, and then demonstrate that you've read certain chapters from the book. So it's described in the in the web uh, wiki web page. Uh, and also the uh, the points will be used at the end of the course to assess your portfolio. So your portfolio will kind of uh, have a certain um, work done and then it will be kind of uh, used for um, calculating your grade. Uh, so the process is a little bit more uh, point-based compared to last year, such that it's like uh, much easier to explain what is for what, right? Um, I can tell you that if you manage the obliques, you basically have to have 40 points and 40 points is E, right? 
So if you do nothing else, you pass the course, okay? So then if you just do the initial thing for the obliques, then you pass the course, uh, even if you do no, nothing else. And then if you do more or less, something else, then you will get better grade, right? Uh, so if you do uh, more, then you get D, C, B, A, right? Uh, but if you do nothing apart from the obliques, then you pass the course. Um, so the oblique is sort of like, if someone doesn't pass the oblique, that means, okay, we're not actually allowing you to submit the portfolio because you have to repeat the course. But if you pass the oblique, you pass the course, okay? Yeah, you had a question? Uh, what's the deadline? There is no deadline. So the deadline is basically the end of semester where you have to submit your portfolio. Um, that's uh, how it works in, in, in theory, right? Because in practice, to get points for the labs, you have to talk to the teaching assistant, right? And then if you think about it, uh, it's about 60 of you. It's four teaching assistants, right? So each week there is a lab. So each week, each of us has about 15 of you to check, right? So if you don't do it the first week, the next week we have 30 of you to check, right? So it's physically impossible for me to check like, you know, 30 of you in a single day, right? So some of you is not, are not gonna be checked, right? So the deadline theoretically is at the end of semester, but Arnold may say, I have exams. I can only dedicate two hours, right? So he can check, you know, I don't know, 30 people, right? And that's it. Uh, so if you have like uh, 120 labs to be checked, some of the labs are not going to be checked physically because it's impossible, right? So I encourage you to be kind of diligent and be kind of submitting your labs kind of on a regular basis. Don't wait until the end of semester because you are running a risk that none of us will be able to check your labs and your labs are not going to be checked, right? Um, so that's the, that, that, that's the constraint, right? The constraint is that it's only four of us and if we work regularly, we can do everything, but if we wait until the end of semester, we can only do so much. And then some people may be upset that some things are not checked, but you know, um, the teaching assistants, they have their own exams. They have to prepare things at the end of semester as well. So try to be kind of regular, right? Yeah. yeah. It was mentioned that you get extra points for delivering on time. Yes, that's correct. On time. What on time is there is a date in the lab and that's the session between two and four on Friday. So if you be checked by uh, me or teaching assistant by the four o'clock on Friday, that's on time. If, if you are doing it later, that's out, outside of time. Yeah. Uh, so one more comment. So the labs are designed that they should not take you more than about 10, 15 hours. The ones which we already have, the one to two are very simple. They, they should not take you more than like two or three hours, even if you don't know much. Uh, so the labs are designed that you should kind of do it as a homework during the week and be done with, right? Um, some later assignments will be a little bit more challenging. So some of the assignments may be worth like, you know, 10 hours of work or, or 12. Uh, so then you may need a little bit extra time, right? So the harder ones are to kind of uh, promote the good students. And if you are like struggling with it, just give up, like just, just don't spend time on it. Like do the simple ones, right? So do as, as much as you can with all the simple labs um, and don't like uh, get focused on the really hard ones, which will be announced later in the semester because some of you may really struggle, right? For some of you, it might be like six hours of work and for some of you, it might be like after 30 hours, you're not getting nowhere, right? And that's normal. So then just, just don't do it. Okay. Yep. Uh, if there's different point amounts for labs, how do you know? It doesn't say on the lab how many points it's worth. It says. It does? Yep. So let's check. If you go to Git. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to keep things in two places, which might be a little bit confusing. So um, if you go to the course, in the course, you have the labs advertised. And if you go to lab one, uh, it says how many points there is, uh, what language you should use, what is the deadline, and so on, right? And it basically is the lab. So the labs are advertised in the course, um, in the course uh, Git repository. They, um, sorry, if I go here. So if you are in the course, the labs are here. If you go to the wiki, 
uh, I'm telling you what I sort of expect you to be at at that point. So at the completion of lab one, we expect you to know certain things. And that's the description of kind of expectation. It's not the description of the lab itself, right? Uh, it's just the description for you to be roughly being able to, add, to kind of know of where you should be in the course. And if you're falling behind, you can tell me or tell TAs are like, oh yeah, we kind of struggling with this or that. We had it last year, like a lot of people struggled with faults. Uh, faults are not that easy. So just tell us, then we kind of, I will explain it more in the lectures, right? But the expectations are kind of here, uh, but the labs are in the, not in the wiki, the labs are in the Git, uh, Git repo, right? And the point system is, is kind of, uh, is, is there. Okay, any other questions? Yep. Uh, like, in, like in lab one, for example, are you supposed to make a new stack project for each task, or, or are you supposed to make one kind of big project, or? Um, yeah, let me just check it. And then you have lab two, which seems more like you are, you are supposed to use several projects. But I'm not sure. Yeah, so in lab one, we starting with just a basic hello world, then we adding this and then we adding H, H right? So in um, this, all those three tasks, you can do in a single project, right? And then when you're showing it, you can kind of show the final thing to uh, to me or to Arnold or to uh, Alexander. And then you say, yeah, I've done this, I've done this, and I've done this. It's one project is fine. Uh, in the same project, you can also do this function, right? So you can add function, which is completely not related to your hello world kind of thing and say, yeah, I have a test for it. And it kind of works like this. So for lab one, I would say you can just use one project for all of this, right? Uh, sometimes it will be difficult to kind of mix uh, two things in a single project, uh, but in this case, uh, perfectly fine, right? Because like in lab two, there are several tasks that seem to be several projects. How does that work with uh, running them in IDs and stuff? Or can you run them in IDs? Yep, so uh, like for example, in this one, you are reversing a list, you're multiplying a table uh, and you're doing, yeah. So for this one, you probably want to have multiple projects. So you basically can say, you can create a subgroup in your workspace group called lab two. And then in this lab two, you can have uh, two or three projects. You just say uh, stack new lab, uh, lab two one, lab two two, lab two three. And then you can kind of load a particular thing in your ID and just work on one thing at a time. There is no dependency between them. So you, you're just working on a single project at the time, right? You, you understand that? That you can have multiple projects under a kind of a common common umbrella. Yeah. There is no real um like it is like out of convenience. Like it's a little bit difficult to be doing, for example, um this uh student thing together with this one because you want to have an executive and you want to show like how it looks like. So you should have two projects, right? Um, but with the first lab one where you're only doing a function and you're calling the function to demonstrate something, like you, you don't need a, you know, a project, a separate project for it, yeah. Um, there is no, um, like if you feel like one way is better than the other, just do what you feel and then explain to the TA like why you did it this way, right? Okay, uh, other questions? All right, so let's get back to talking about programming. We learning programming, not scripting. Um, all right, uh, another one. Where is my mentee? Uh, yeah, let's do it. I lost my browser somewhere. So C and C++. Both have type inference, do not have type inference. C++ XX has type inference, C doesn't. C has type inference, C++ doesn't. Uh, 
brilliant. Most people pay attention to what I just said 10 minutes ago, right? Um, so you do have type inference in C++ because they introduced the concept of auto. Uh, in C, you don't because they didn't introduce the concept of auto. All right. Some reshuffling and the, yeah, but second try still leads, I think. Excellent. All right, so um, we only have two hours per week to lecture, right? And that's not enough to learn uh, two programming languages. You will need to do a bit of work at home. So you do need to read the books and you do need to do the work at home, okay? Um, there is a little bit of balance between practice and theory. I kind of try to convey as much theory as possible, but using the practical kind of aspects. So we will be doing, yeah. Yeah, so there is an online version of both books. So you can read it online, yeah. Yeah, it's in the GitLab wiki. There, there is a link there, yeah. Uh, reading a book only and watching a tutorials on YouTube is not enough. You may think that you've learned something, but you will really learn if you actually do it yourself, right? So even if you're watching something that seems trivial, uh, try open a new stack project and try it out yourself, right? Just type it, right? Because you will learn more. You, it will kind of stick in your memory better if you actually try things out. Um, so I, I kind of stress that practice is important. And that's why half of the time we spend me talking and half of the time we spend doing things, right? You doing labs and talking about the labs, about the practical things. Um, we cannot neglect theory. So some concepts like, you know, functor, uh, we cannot discuss if you don't understand what functor is, right? So you will kind of need to understand some of the theory behind some of the things that we're doing, right? So algebraic da data types, right? Um, algebraic data types, ADTs. You, you kind of need to read the books and you need to try to understand it. Ask me questions, ask questions to the TAs and try to understand the theory, right? Uh, so ADTs, uh, type classes, um, folds, recursion. There is a lot of new things that are kind of theoretical. They are not specific to Haskell that are kind of uh, important. Functors, um, monads, um, you will see as we move on with the with the material that there is some terminology that you need to understand. Use ChatGPT to explain things to you, right? If you find kind of a code snippet, which is doing something, ask it why it works this way. Ask like, why are we using this, right? Uh, what does it mean that there is a functor here? Um, you can chat with ChatGPT and most of the time it's actually quite useful. Uh, it will probably sometimes make a mistake. Um, and then you can get bonus points if you find like errors, like in my slides or in chat GPT conversations. Uh, sometimes it will kind of lie to you. And then if you can pick it up, then like uh, put a issue, issue in the issue tracker, put a screenshot of what chat GPT was telling you. And then you say that's wrong because it's like this, right? You can verify it with the book or you can verify it with the code. And then you can kind of spot errors. Uh, so if you, if if it, it's lying to you, that's good if you can find it, right? Uh, but most of the time it actually is very useful for explanations. So use ChatGPT to explain things to you and you try to understand it, okay? Um, you should not use things in your code which you don't understand. So if, you're, if you've done a lab and the TA asks you like, what is this? And you say, I don't know, that invalidates your lab basically, right? If you are showing something that you don't know how it works, you can take code from ChatGPT, no problem. You can ask ChatGPT to solve things for you, but you have to understand how it works. You have to be able to explain how it works, right? Uh, so don't um, just blindly copy something from Stack Overflow or from ChatGPT without understanding it. Copying is fine, using Copilot is fine, but you do need to understand what the code is doing and how it works. So for example, if you are using some monads, and you don't know how monads work, don't use monads, use recursion, use something else that you understand um, instead. There is always many different ways of achieving something. So try to achieve it through the mechanisms that you understand. 
And then once you learn more complex things, you can replace it. You can kind of make it better by replacing it with something that is more expressive. But you kind of need to get there, like, you know, and you, you, you're not going to get there immediately. You're going to kind of get there step by step. All right. So then um, practice. Can you get fit from watching videos? No. But you can get ideas how to get fit from watching videos. The videos can show you which exercises are useful, right? So they are useful. Uh, but you will not get fit just watching videos, right? You do need to do the work. Okay, um, why are we stressing theory? Well, we're stressing theory because we want to talk. We want to talk with other team members. We want to talk about which solution is better than the other. And we need to use a language of describing things. Uh, so that's, the, that's why theory is important because without the theory, we will lack this ability to express what we mean, right? why a tail recursion is different from a non-tail recursive function, why it is wrong or why it is bad that this implementation is tail recursive and it's a good thing and why this one isn't and why it's bad, right? Um, so if you don't understand the terms, it will be really hard to talk with the rest of the team. Uh, so pay attention to the terminology. Um, okay, um, final quiz question. Yes, I found my Mentimeter. Start quiz. About, about C++ 17 or 18, okay. Does C++ XX has function polymorphism? Doesn't have function polymorphism, okay. Did you pay attention to what I just said, like, you know, 20 minutes ago? Easy question. Of course it has. And you probably have used it in the C++ course. All right. Some people were faster than others. That second try has won. Congratulations. All right, as a programmer, you will be wearing different hats, okay? So let's consider a very simple function or very simple simple program. So a client comes to you and the client says, I need a program where I enter two numbers and uh, the program gives me the sum of those two numbers back, okay? How trivial is that? How hard is that? Who thinks it's trivial? I think it's pretty trivial. Who thinks it's not trivial? So everybody thinks it's trivial. Yeah, you don't think it's trivial? Why? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. So, you, so you're kind of getting an idea, like uh, should that be integer, right? It's a little bit unspecified, like, uh, what do you mean a number? Is it like a binary number or is it like a decimal number or is it a floating point number? What, what do you mean by number? You already have to talk to your customer because that seems obvious what you need to do. Like, it, it seems obvious to, to, to use integers, but, you know, it actually turns out that the guy wanting this app is actually having numbers in binary. That's why he needs an app, because if it was in decimal, he would just use a calculator, right? Um, so, okay, he didn't say, or she didn't say, right? So you are wearing multiple hats. Uh, one of the hat is the analyst. You actually need to understand the requirements. What are the requirements? What type of numbers are those? Are they in hex or are they in decimal? Like what will they be? Uh, what should I do with the overflow? Like, is it arbitrary numbers? They are like, you know, arbitrarily large numbers, 120 digits, or they are constrained to certain range. Because if they are constrained to a certain range, maybe I can use int 32, right? Or int 64. How about the sign? Will I have negative numbers or only positive numbers? There's a lot of questions, which this specification doesn't say, right? So it kind of looks trivial, 
but it's actually like non-trivial at all. Like you actually have to ask all those questions to the to the person to understand what you really need to do because you don't know yet, right? All right, so you're wearing kind of an analyst hat. And then you need to find a solution, right? Okay, we're dealing with binary, arbitrary length, no overflow possible, no negative numbers, okay? So then you have to think, okay, how to solve it, right? How are we gonna solve it? Uh, how are we gonna parse it? Are we, what are we gonna to use, right? Uh, and then you need to implement it. Like you need to tell the coder to do it, right? So you need to tell ChatGPT what to do, right? Um, and then you need to have a test and you need to kind of validate it and verify it, right? So what's the difference between validation and verification? What, let, let's, let's do uh, verification first. What's verification? Making sure it works. Uh, it works as intended. Yeah, so um, both are kind of to work as intended, but the verification is the work as intended from the programmer or coder perspective, right? So if I'm writing a function which adds two decimal numbers, my verification will be to check if the function returns the sum, right? So that would be the verification. Validation will be to show it to the customer and ask the customer, does, does it do what you want? And says no because I, I have binary numbers and what you like you know I I entered I entered, uh, I entered um, this right and you've added it like as if it is one thousand and so on and you gave me like this answer and like you know it's supposed to be binary like I don't have two as a digit right uh, you did it wrong so verification fa passed because verification did what we wanted to do. And validation failed because it's not what the customer wants, right? Um, so validation is always with the stakeholder, with the customer, to check if it fits the requirements with them. And the ver verification is we have unit tests, we write our own tests, and we can verify that it's doing what it's supposed to do in code. Right, so we see that it's kind of um, not as easy as we thought. Um, Okay, so we have only 10 minutes left um, and I finished last week session uh, and we are a little bit behind. Any questions to this? It's pretty obvious, uh, pretty simple. So let's move on to the, to the Haskell thing. Um, Right, so there is a different mentee. I will start it today, but we, you know, in 10 minutes, we're not going to be able to finish it. So uh, I will have to finish it uh, next next time. Uh, all right, so. Let's talk a little bit about quickly about Haskell. So. I will put the slides uh, on the on the uh, course um, um, course Git, GitLab project. So I already talked about uh, submissions sort of through uh, teaching assistants, um, but we will have um, we will have some uh, course peer review. So we will have some larger tasks. And then I will ask you to peer review each other code, right? Uh, and for that, we will use a, a, a kind of a submission system. It will be the same in cloud. So Christopher is also doing that uh, and he's doing it for assignments. Uh, I will do it just for one or two tasks such that you get a bit of a feel uh, and you will kind of see how other people solve something, right? Um, we are using the workspace for the, um, for your um, portfolios and there is a date. So it's PROC 206, uh, 2024 workspace. Um, this I will announce later. And then if you have any questions or any issues, you can make an issue in the issue tracker for the course, or you can ask questions in the Discord. Um, if it's like a simple question, ask just in Discord. If it's more complicated, uh, ask in the issue tracker. And then me or the teaching assistants will try to help you. Uh, so please use it. All right. Um, 
Okay. Um, I am gonna kind of, I don't gonna uh, discuss it with you. I'm gonna just tell you, right? What makes a programming language? Um, a programming language is made out of a couple of things, four things specifically. Um, so the on the surface, a programming language is based on the syntax. So we say uh, C and Lua are different programming languages because they have different syntax, right? Um, or you can say Lua and Python are different programming languages because they have different syntax. And that's true, but the syntax is the least interesting part of the whole thing, right? Syntax is very easy to learn. So like, how do you do assignments in programming languages? Well, you know, in most programming languages, you say variable name uh, and then assign symbol, and then you have a value or some expression, right? So a value or expression here. Okay, and the assignments are done by this, right? And then comes Golang and Golang says, no, no, you, you not only do that like this, you can do that by the semicolon here, right? Okay, big deal. You learn one extra, like one extra thing, right? About the assignments, but you already know how assignments work. And you know that this one is for a declared variables. So you have to declare a variable and use this one. If you have undeclared variable P, so this one is with the declared one. This one is for non-declared variable. It declares and assigns at the, at the single line, right? Um, but you know the concept of declaring something and you know the concept of assigning, right? So then learning this in Golang is like trivial because you are familiar with the other two concepts, right? So that's where the semantics comes from. Uh, the semantics is the meaning of what we are actually doing, right? Um, and then the syntax is just the symbols, it's just the characters that we use to express it. Um, abstract syntax is kind of an intermediate uh, syntax between the textual syntax and the semantics. So the semantics is what does it mean to do this and to do this expression here, right? So it means declare P and assign. Uh, what does it mean here? For a declared variable P, which was previously declared, we're doing the assign, right? So you can kind of, uh, usually we do abstract syntax as a tree. So we have some form of um, uh, expression or statement and as a root, and then we have some form of um, um, behavior, right? So if I say, if I, if I write an expression in uh, fourth, which is like doing add two numbers, two and three, and it's, it's in the fourth, syntax, right? If I do it in Python, it would be two plus three. If I do it in, um, you know, C, it would be two plus three, right? So those are concrete C syntax. Uh, this one is Python syntax. Um, so you see that uh, in fourth, this, the syntax is different, but if we write an abstract syntax tree for what it, it is doing, it would be plus here, uh, two and three. It would be like this. And this abstract syntax tree is exactly the same for all those concrete syntaxes, right? So the abstract, abstract syntax is kind of an abstract representation of the textual syntax, which we use to encode the abstract one, right? And the abstract one, so you have a concrete syntax here with text, you have abstract syntax with the tree, usually kind of a drawing, and then you have the semantics which is the understanding of what does it mean. And the semantics usually is a kind of a text, is a description, is a kind of a human understanding of what it's doing, right? Um, so what is the, what's the hardest? The hardest is this. Uh, the textual representation is kind of easy, right? So once you know C++, it's kind of very easy to migrate to any other language which is sort of similar to C++, right? Um, you basically have this and the kind of difficulty comes here. Uh, so don't get hang on on the, on the textual representation, kind of uh, try to kind of focus on the semantics. And then the final thing is different semantics will kind of lead to this kind of, uh, kind of a paradigm to the thinking, right? Because in object-oriented semantics, we have this particular way to see problems or to see representations as objects and the relationship between objects. In uh, semantics, which uses functional metaphor, we will be kind of thinking like 
about functions, right? So depending on what, what this is, it kind of leads to the particular way of thinking. So that's what makes kind of a programming language. Like it, it has those four layers and the final one is sort of the paradigm. Um, all right, so let's do two more slides. Um, so how we would explain what a loop is. Um, well, you can kind of explain it using the text. You can kind of explain it using a picture of what it's actually doing. And then, you know, different languages will do this picture differently. Some are using kind of a keyword for, uh, some are using a keyword for each, for each. Uh, some are doing kind of a, a recursion, right? So you can have kind of a, a loop done by a recursion. Some are using faults. So you could say that there is a kind of a fault to express a loop. Uh, so, but what the loop is on a picture, it would be kind of a, you would have some sort of a circular process, which kind of loops itself until a certain condition is fulfilled and then it quits, right? So the picture will be very similar to no matter what kind of you doing here, right? And then semantics will depend a little bit on like what you're actually doing it, like how, how this kind of a circular process happens, right? Yeah, exactly. So that's a good answer. Um, so a loop, like if you're explaining the loop, you're sort of operating on, on those four different levels, right? If you want to kind of explain it. All right, so let, let's make it the last slide then, because this one is a little bit about um, Haskell. We only have two questions in this. Yeah, we we covered that a little bit in the in the cloud course last week. Christopher talked about the the timelines and the kind of depends on, dependency on, on on language of languages. Um, so, you know, you can always look it up. Like it's not uh, something that you should know by heart, but um, you kind of it places the um, where the where the language fits in, right? So you know, uh, C are uh, sort of older, and then there are some younger languages, and you can sort of see kind of the um, the dependency on what what has happened. So before Haskell happened, we had kind of a um, two main branches of languages, or, or let's say three, three, three branches. So you had a C, C family of languages, you had ML, uh, and you had Smalltalk. And Smalltalk is a precursor of kind of object-oriented path, path line and message passing. ML is the functional one, and C is what you know. C kind of derived from assembly, right? Um, and then in the 80s, kind of all those uh, three branches were kind of growing. So uh, C was sort of getting uh, more towards the small talk, to towards the object, object orientation. So you have Objective-C and C++, right? So you see a marriage between C and small talk. Uh, and then ML was kind of uh, getting more fragmented. Um, and there were a lot of different languages talking about functions. Uh, and then Haskell happened. So Haskell was sort of... a uh, a community-driven initiative to standardize how we're gonna talk about programming languages and how we're gonna kind of uh, experiment with them. And then you had, um, in 90s, you have quite a lot of scripting. So Python was kind of a very uh, rich response to the needs of bash scripting. We had bash and we had kind of shells, but you wanted to have to be able to do more with, within the shell. So it's a script, perfect scripting language. Uh, and then you had a, a need for making cross-platform. Uh, and C++ was kind of difficult to be really truly cross-platform. Of course, it always was, but it was kind of difficult to maintain it and difficult to distribute it. So Java was sort of a response to try to get something cross-platform and include the browser. Java was sort of the initial um, language to have code run as a bytecode inside the browsers through Java applets. Uh, and then you had OCaml, which kind of mixes again some of the object orientation with functional. And then the latest iteration is um, you have C Sharp, F Sharp, Golang and Rust, which are kind of the most modern kind of reincarnations of the same pathways. 
uh, with F sharp being kind of a combination of functional and, and C-like line, um, Golang you know, and Rust is like trying to, to do C++, but kind of slightly differently. Um, all right, so we are kind of running out of time, so I will finish here. I will put slides on um, on the the um, the website, and the lab one and two are basically some of the things which I'm covering here in the slides. So they talk about the list uh, data structure, and they mention some of the methods that uh, the labs also mentioned that you should try to familiarize yourself with. All right, so thank you.